everybody, and welcome to the second episode of Double Coverage with Jackie and Cassidy. This week's episode is called The One Where They Go Mad. Cassidy, nice seeing you again. Nice seeing you too, Jackie. I feel a little mad after this week. We've got spring practice. Not a bad mad, just going crazy. We've got spring practice going on. Uh, March Madness starts up here soon. Gainesville just went through Gator Nationals weekend, which if those of you don't know, is the, one of the biggest drag racing events in the world, which basically just means you can't get to Publix or anywhere else you want to go. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> the world feels a little mad right now, but I'll take it over everything being shut down. Yeah, it's it's been fantastic the last couple of days. I will tell you when I saw that Selection Sunday show, mm -hmm hearing that music, hearing those teams <laughs> called, <laughs> it was glorious, especially yes. considering where we were one year ago. Yep, I've got my brackets filled out. I made two, because it's my life and I can make the rules. And I have a- <laughs> Well, <laughs> I, have I will a... say you certainly made the rules on your choices there, some other choices there, Cassie. Exactly, right. I have Gonzaga winning in one, I have Baylor winning in the other, I have Florida winning the the Friday game in one. I have Florida losing the Friday game in the other. I don't have them making it out of the first weekend. Sorry. Let's talk, let's talk football and we won't go down that road yet. <laughs> oh, so this is the last week of the Gators spring practice for the 2021 off season. Most schools are getting ready to start their spring practice next week. Florida said, peace out, we're done. We'll see you in six months. So it's going to be a long six months for this team as they get ready, as they get back together, and as they really move into the player-led workouts. Uh, coaches can have some interaction. There just cannot be the throwing of the football involved in those summer interactions. Um, that's one of the perks to Dan Mullen's staff is that the coaching stays the same, so then the players know what to expect. But one of the big coaching changes this offseason, of course, something that we've talked about here and there, is losing Brian Johnson, offensive yeah. coordinator Brian Johnson, who is now the passing game coordinator for the Eagles and Jalen Hurts in the NFL. We wish him luck. Love Brian. He's going to do great there. Can't wait to see what he does with Hurts. That means Florida then had to find somebody new. You know, Dan Mullen doesn't have a lot of staff turnover. So what did he do? He went in-house. He promoted Garrick McGee was a former head coach at UAB. He's a former coordinator for Arkansas, Louisville. He was Lamar Jackson's offensive coordinator when he was in college. And he had been serving as a defensive analyst last year for the Gators. Uh, the, a lot of coaches make guys do that. They make them go study the other side of the ball so that they can therefore know their side better. And then he was able to promote from within. Uh, so when you have a guy who is not a huge name like that, it sort of brings up the question as to how is this power structure going to work? And we talked to Garrick McGee a couple of nights ago. It's the first time we've been able to talk to him since he got that promotion and became the offensive coordinator or, or quarterback coach, I think he's technically called, mm -hmm. and asked, what does this mean? What does this relationship look like? Uh, what, is, what is that power structure? And he said something, Jackie, that I thought was really interesting. And it's one of the more interesting things I've ever heard, a, ever heard a coach say, because coaches are notoriously egotistical Yeah. for better or for worse. They are egotistical and it's what can make them the best at their jobs and sometimes horrible to deal with off the field. Uh, but it, it's just part of their structure. It's part of what makes them super focused and believe that they can win any game. Uh, but Garrett McGee said something really interesting. He said, I think when you're chasing a championship, that every person in the building should do the thing they're best at. So if you have someone in the building who is the best at doing a thing, that person should do that thing. Dan Mullen is one of the, if not the best play callers in the country. So if the Florida Gators are going to chase a championship, then Dan Mullen should be calling the plays if he is the best at that thing. And when he said that, it just kind of knocked me backwards because I was like, that's so simple, but you're so right. And it's, there's usually a tug of war between coaches and coordinators. And, you know, that was an issue with Auburn for years. Right. Does Gus Malzahn call the plays? Does he let the coordinator call the plays? And then there was the whole hoopla a couple of years ago where he got a new coordinator and he said, I'm taking back the play calling duties. 
Garrett McGee simply said, Dan Mullen's the best play caller in the country. Why the heck would I not let him do it? If we're going to win and if we're going to be a great team, then everybody needs to be doing the thing they're best at. Dan mm-hmm. Mullen's the best in the country at play calling. He should be doing that thing. And so I think that kind of tells us also, which we had predicted here and there, how that relationship would work. Um, you know, Garrett McGee didn't get the technical title of offensive coordinator like Brian Johnson did. But again, Brian Johnson only had that title for one year. Before that, he was the quarterback coach as well because Mullen, Billy Gonzalez, and John Hevesy, and then the, the quarterback coach all sort of share that offensive coordinator role. I think that's what they're going to go back to doing this year. I purely believe one of the main reasons that Dan Mullen gave Brian Johnson the title last year was to give him an opportunity. He trusted him, but to give him an opportunity to uh, kind of show what he could do and get another job, which is exactly what happened. He, he took a step up. Um, they're going to go back to how it used to be. Mullen, Gonzalez, Hevesy, and now McGee, all sort of all sharing that offensive coordinator role. And they're all going to have input into the play calls, but Dan Mullen will have the final word. He will be on the headset, I believe, making play calls when they take the field this fall. No, I think that you touched on it. It's such a simple solution. And mm-hmm. sometimes the simplest thing is the best. And I mm-hmm. think what Florida has done, and this is something that Dan Mullen has done, is figure out a way to find your best personnel on the field and fit them in the best spot for them to perform. And it's nice to hear they're also doing that on the staff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I think that was a a, a good move. And seeing that there's not going to be a tug of war, there's not going to be bitter sentiment between, you know, two coaches that goes a long way into creating a chemistry on that offensive side. This has a lot of turnover. Um, especially on as far as players with Kyle Trask on Emory Jones getting the keys to the offense. You've got a great running back room. You're, you're, you're dealing with no Kyle Pitts, no Kadarius Tony. So it's good to hear that there's that simplistic approach, but you know what, Cassidy, you know, what's not going to be simple recruiting. <laughs> it never it, is. It never is, but I will give credit to the staff for how they accomplished a lot of things during this weird pandemic in 2020 and how recruiting kind of changed just because you couldn't have kids on campus. And I will say Florida did a good job of still getting some high quality talent in the door during this time period but now they're they're eventually and next few weeks here are going to be able to see players in person they're going to be scheduling official visits we're going to see camps again which means the players are going to be able to attend university of florida camps and mullen and staff are going to be able to see current film of these players and evaluate them Um, so that's going to be huge for this team for this team kind of moving forward and seeing where they're going to really get those pieces. Because I think the reason that Florida did so well in recruiting as far as during the pandemic was because a lot of the guys that they were able to get actually visited campus before this pandemic hit because Florida was able to get these in-state players on unofficial visits uh, before they were seniors. So they were able to come during that seven on seven tournament, not in the summer 2020, but in the summer of 2019. So a lot of those Sunshade State players were in Gainesville already. So they were familiar with campus. Those players were not able to take official visits to schools further away. And that was a huge advantage that Florida had. I think geography played a great role. And honestly, a lot of these players, again, a lot of these players don't get the opportunity to take unofficial visits. A lot of their things are unofficial visits and they didn't have official visits. So I think Florida was able to adapt and use their strength, which is, hey guys, here's the players that I developed this fall season, come to Florida, see my Mm -hmm. resume. But they didn't have all the noise of, you know, Alabama rolling the red carpet during the official visit. You didn't have Clemson doing everything possible to get them to commit on a visit. So those all things played a a good, played a big role in why Florida was able to accomplish what they did. Now everyone's going to be out there recruiting again. So that means they need to kind of, they, they need to, 
slow things up a little bit. They need to accelerate. They got to, they have to make sure they're not going to step behind in Alabama or Clemson. Because again, we talked about this a couple of times, Cassidy, um, over the course of the last few months on the radio, on Buddy Martin show, or on our editorials, that Florida, in order to meet Alabama, in order to jump Alabama as an SEC powerhouse and win the national championships, they need to recruit depth. I know Dan Mullen has done a great job in the transfer portal, but in order to take the next step, they really need to do well on the recruiting front to recruit that depth. So they don't always have to do a band-aid approach because at the end of the day, you want players to develop within your system and learn that system rather than just hopefully getting a guy in a transfer portal. I know the transfer portal changes the game and kudos to Dan Mullen to realizing that and going after guys in the transport to fix holes. But at the end of the day, you still need to recruit high school players to keep that culture going. Cause at the end of the day, a high school player seeing a transfer portal guy come in and get number one and number two on the depth chart is not going to be encouraging to future high school players. Cause they're thinking, why should I choose Florida? If in two, three years, a transfer will come in and take my spot. So I think that's also where you're, you're dealing with the long-term gain here. So that's why recruiting is going to be such a big, but honestly, Florida is doing well, even now, you know, we were just, you know, talking about the recruiting opening up, but honestly, recruiting never stops. And Florida was able to get three commits over the last month, including a six foot seven tight end. I thought I read that wrong when I first saw it. I was like, oh, somebody typed wrong or they're being sarcastic. And then I opened the video. Like, no, dear God, <laughs> DJ Hawkins is a nightmare and he's from Tampa, Florida. Again, keeping those in-state guys in state and actually the two guys they just picked up both from the Tampa Bay area, Tony Livingston, another uh, tight end. And obviously they picked up Nick Evers uh, a couple of days ago as well, early on in the March. So they have been picking up some good guys on the recruiting trail. But again, when things open up, you have to keep hold of these guys. Um, and obviously it's going to change the game a little bit. And, you know, with recruiting going on, you also know that basketball is going on. And I'm so excited about March Madness, Cassidy and University of Florida are going to be playing the opening game of the tournament. Um, obviously Mike White and the Gators not having the best end to the season so far. Um, it wasn't the best showing for them. They are not they're not being consistent, which is something that we've talked about how this program hasn't been consistent enough, but Florida did get a pretty high seed considering, I think Cassidy, we thought they were going to be in the ninth or ninth or 10th seed. Yeah. I, I was thinking eight at the highest, but probably nine or 10. And when that's when they rolled their name out there next to that seven, it's like, Oh, they, they accidentally put the name on too early. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. I, I think they're, they were crediting them for, um, early season quality wins quad mm -hmm. one tier one wins you know Tennessee West Virginia things like that and then uh, Thomas Goldcamp at 24 7 I, I can't tell if he was being sarcastic or not but he <laughs> pointed <laughs> you can never tell it done he yes, pointed something out yeah that I thought was interesting did the committee take into account hardship for the Gators uh, honestly see I can see that yeah, and that's something that the college football playoff committee has told us that they take into account, that they do consider those things. We've never heard that from the March Madness Committee, the NCAA Selection Committee. It, it may be. It's just never come up as a factor. But when you do see your best player literally collapse on the court, you have to take two weeks off to deal with that emotional distress, and then you take a, a month off because of COVID. Every team dealt with COVID, but Florida really, really did get hit hard with it during the middle of the league season, how much does that factor into what was happening? It, it very well could have been taken into account. Yeah, I think when you have what happened this year too, I think even if they didn't really use hardship in previous years, I could see the committee deciding, you know what, this is an exceptional year where we might have to consider hardships because there's so many teams were stopping and going because of COVID protocols. But in the case of Florida basketball, they also had to deal with a uncertainty when it comes to one of their players and the emotional toll that seeing Keontae Johnson collapse in the middle of a game really took on this team. Um, so I could, I could see them using hardship in this scenario. So yeah, so Florida is opening the NCAA tournament against Virginia Tech, an ACC team. 
All right, so now we're going to look forward to Florida's big game in the NCAA tournament opening up against Virginia Tech. We'll welcome here Richmond Times Dispatch, Mike Barber. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, so obviously a lot of people that you know follow Florida aren't quite familiar with Virginia Tech and the ACC this year. Obviously a lot different ACC <laughs> this year. Um, what are some of the things that Florida fans really need to know about this Hokies team just right off the bat? Yeah, I think the first thing is it starts with defense for Virginia Tech. And, um, you know, everybody in Virginia talks about UVA and the pack line and how good defensively they are. And I had a couple ACC coaches who told me Virginia Tech is like Virginia when you get near the basket, but they're like Florida State when you come across the half court line. Um, they're aggressive. They're athletic. They'll get out on you. They'll get their arms in the passing lane. But then it's really hard to get to the rim against them. And um, they've been able to do that all year. And, and you know, there's two guys that kind of make that defense go. And, um, again, very similar to, to if you look at a Virginia with somebody at the top and somebody at the back. It's, it's Wabisa Beatty uh, for Virginia Tech, their point guard, very physical. I know he once told me that he liked to play pickup basketball with football players because it, it helped knock them around and, and, and get that kind of physical uh, nature that he needed. Um, he, it starts with him. He's a great perimeter defender, a great on-ball defender, um, and a very smart defensive player. He knows what's happening in the defense. And then on the back end, Keve Aluma, the, the transfer from Wofford, who if we talk about offense, he's been phenomenal, but I think people overlook his defense. He is um, excellent one-on-one, -on -one, man to man certainly, but he's a great help defender. He's able to get out on a shooter and get back. He's able to help off a guy and then still be their rim protector. So what he's been able to do on the back end, with what Wabisa Bidi has been able to do at the top of the defense has really made them an excellent defensive team really all year long. And the last few games, and it's something that I've noticed in the course of the season is they don't lack, they lack consistency. They're not the most consistent team in the ACC. And even in the last, what, five games, there've been three and two, a little ups and downs, but they're shooting pretty well. What has been the difference the last few games? Well, part of it is COVID pauses, and, and they certainly came off a COVID pause going into the ACC tournament. And what you saw against North Carolina, I think, was twofold. One, I don't think they're the biggest still. They've gotten bigger up front, uh, but they're not the biggest front court team. And I thought Carolina took advantage of that. But uh, I thought they ran out of gas. And it's the second or third time this year where they've kind of come off a, a COVID pause and just uh, had trouble with their stamina, had trouble with their conditioning. Um, you know, I think that's really been the story of the ACC is the inconsistency. Um, you look at Duke, you look at Carolina. I mean, Florida State, I, I thought was I thought was the best team in the league all year. And then they lost the regular season title because they kind of threw away their regular season finale with Notre Dame. So I think Virginia Tech absolutely has been that kind of an up and down team. Uh, they've also been dealing in those in that stretch you're talking about. They had a player get suspended, Tyrese Radford, for a DWI and a gun charge. Uh, then they got him back. Um, working him in has certainly made them better, but it was a change. And Jalen Cohen, their, their really talented uh, shooting guard, he's been out with an ankle injury, and they've been unsure about when he's coming back. So I think all of that plays together and, and why they've been up and down. And um, again, the defense has been pretty solid all the way through, but um, it, it's not always a complete effort, uh, and it's certainly not always a, a good offensive effort. Now, Florida, I, I think you summed up Florida in some of your lines there as well, because they also have been inconsistent. I think there's just going to be a theme across the board with teams in this year because of COVID and just inconsistency of play. They're, they're, sometimes they're stopping for two or three games. They're just not playing consistently enough. Um, but when you talk about Florida and you're talking about Virginia Tech's defense, Florida is a very good shooting team right now in the SEC, and they're doing pretty well on the outside, apart from the last few games. Again, not, in, not consistent. <laughs> um, how do you see Virginia Tech's defense on, from, uh, defending from the outside? Yeah, I think this is actually a good matchup. Not a good matchup, um, but a, a, a better matchup for Virginia Tech in that Florida is a guard-driven team, um, starting with Trey Mann. But, you know, they're a team that's built on their perimeter scoring, and even though they're really good at that, I think that's where Virginia Tech is strongest defensively. Uh, I think they have some versatile pieces uh, like Radford, like Nahima Lean. Uh, we already talked about Wubi Sabidi on the ball. So I think they're much more comfortable and better defending a team like this as opposed to to a North Carolina or a Florida state that has the size and the depth up front. Um, you know, that being said, 
the, the challenge is still going to be if teams are hitting shots, what do you do? And, and if you get Virginia Tech kind of uh, into the situation where they're over rotating, over helping like anybody else, they become a lot easier to attack. But um, I think, you know, if you're a Virginia Tech fan and you're looking at the scouting report, you're glad you're not facing a, a team that plays a big lineup, you know, three power forward center types, mm -hmm. because that's really, I think, what's given them the most trouble. So finally, when you look at this matchup and you look at these two teams, do you think it's going to be coming down to free throws? You know, it's interesting that I think it's going to be incredibly close because um, I thought Virginia Tech got an under was underseeded. I thought they were going to be about a seven or an eight seed. I think Florida deserves to be a seven or an eight seed, like right in that range. So to me, this is a coin toss game. And um, Free throws have been, it's funny, every time I ask Mike Young about free throws, he says, we're a good free throw shooting team, but it feels like every time I cover a game, they're just missing a ton at the, at the stripe. So um, it really is, um, it has the potential to be one of the better first round games. Um, I don't know that it's fair to either team. I, I think, you know, tech fans focus on, oh, they should be higher than a 10 seed. That's not fair. Well, it's also not fair <laughs> to the seven seed that is playing, I think, a better opponent. And um, you know, I think Florida deserved an easier draw as a seven seed than getting a, a Virginia Tech team that I think was unseeded. Um, it does feel kind of like a coin toss game. And, and, and you wonder, I don't know uh, Florida's free throw shooting numbers, but uh, that's been among Virginia Tech's inconsistencies. Yeah, well, Florida has done well on the free throw line, but they're not doing well getting those free throws. So it'll be very interesting to see when they face off on the court. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today and good seeing you. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Mike, thank you so much for joining us and giving us that insight into Virginia Tech. Don't forget Florida and Virginia Tech tip off at 1215 Eastern on Friday on CBS. They are the first game of March Madness, which tells me that if nothing else, they're guaranteed a spot in one shining moment, which is really the only reason we're here. Uh, a guy that has been through a Final Four run, who has been through March Madness, who went through three Elite Eights, then a Final Four, Patrick Young. If you remember, we talked to him last week just to kind of learn what he's been doing since he graduated from Florida, where his life, his basketball has taken him since, and it's been around the world and then all the way back to Gainesville and Jacksonville. And, and he gave us some really good insight onto what it's like to deal with the psyche of, you know, having to move across the world and, and try to exist purely on the sport that you've always known and then what it's like to lose that. If you haven't watched that conversation yet, please do go back. It's really a great lesson in adversity. And then also just kind of tells you what Pat's been up to. Pat had so much good stuff to remind us of and to tell us of. We spent such a long time on just what that final four run was like and what it was like playing with those four seniors. He, Will You Get, Scotty Wilbekin, and Casey Prather. But we had to split it up into two because we didn't want you to miss it. So this week, we bring you part two of our interview with Patrick Young. Because Pat, I don't think you and I have ever talked about this and I've, I've kind of always wanted to circle back to it. The night that y'all got back from winning the Elite Eight, you knew you were gonna go to the final four. One of my favorite memories in Gainesville, um, you know, you, you get to the airport, all those people are there, and then everything sort of shifts to Midtown. And I just remember, like, me and a couple of friends being at the back entrance of 101 Cantina, RIP, and uh, the, the bouncers were like, basketball team only, basketball team only, nobody else. I'm like, I, I know half the people in there ain't on the basketball team. But then somebody in there popped a bottle of, well, I don't know how old y'all were at the time, so we'll call it sparkling grape juice. Uh, it's very cool. <laughs> Okay, it was champagne then. Pops a bottle of champagne, bubbles are going everywhere, bouncers can't keep people out anymore, everybody comes in, fun and food. What do you remember about that night? None of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can believe I remember I remember being at the, the swamp uh -huh. uh, for a second and um, having the net on my yep. neck. Will, I think Will and I had pieces of nets. And, I have a picture somewhere of me and you with that net, but I don't know where it is. Um, yeah, as you said, rest in peace to uh, 101 Cantina. I probably was there a little more than I, I would have preferred. Little, more than I would ever go now, <laughs> now these yeah. days. Uh, so some of those memories kind of blur in together. Uh, but finally achieving that, that moment, mm -hmm. um, and just the recognition, because I think the fans knew how, how badly we wanted it after going three years short. 
And still, going three straight Elite Eights is nothing to overlook. I mean, if you look at Jim Kelly and the Buffalo Bills, four straight Super Bowls, even though you fall short, what feat, what kind of amazing feat that is to, to achieve something so close. I mean, you, who, who defines great? That's so inspirational to me because even you fall short, you get back up, you go and do it again. You fall short, you get back up, you go and do it again. Easily you can, you can deteriorate, doubt, victim mindset, give up. But we, we stayed together. I mean, that, that was a big reason why I decided to stay all four years. I felt as though the work was unfinished. I felt as though I had such a deep connection to my brothers um, that it was more important to me. And I look at it now, you know, it, is money, I could go overseas, I can still play. Is that money more valuable than the relationship that I have here? Is le- And no, it's not. And that's, that's I, I couldn't, I probably couldn't articulate that. Uh, back then, but that is probably what I was feeling. Is going and receiving all those other things more important than the relationship and the work and opportunity, the le- the legacy I can live with these guys that I love to death, that we've done so much that for a coach that I love to death, <laughs> and you know, being able to finally do that. You know, the only the only regret, not the regret, but disappointment Coach Donovan had for us was that we didn't get a chance to play for it all. That's it. That's the only 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 stone we have left unturned. But I wouldn't I wouldn't change a thing for my four years and especially that final four. Is there any sort of moral victory in the fact that it was UConn that year, which is the only team that, you know, forget about Arizona, but UConn was the only team y'all really lost to? Yes, and I'll say the only reason um, yes to that is because they beat Kentucky. Mm -hmm. If they would have lost to Kentucky. By transitive, if they would have lost to Kentucky, by transitive property and the UCF rule, Florida would have been national champions. (laughs) Oh my gosh, if they would have, if, if Kentucky, after beating them three times that year, and Kentucky went to national champion, because we for sure, we we knew, like, Kentucky was our our little brother at this point. We knew them right. so well. We knew what you they were going to do. You didn't even have to beat them in the SEC tournament, and you still did. It, it was, I mean, we all just have that, like, that animosity, that, that idea of just, like, Kentucky, you know, they're, they're, they're good. But we're better. We're more cohesive. We don't care how talented you are. Our defense, our our will, um, what we do, all like that's not in the stats. We love our love for each other because we've been together for so long. Mm-hmm. We don't care about Big Blue. Big Blue can do other things that I'm not going to say. You know, they, <laughs> at least not on and, Sunday. <laughs> and Coach Donovan, Coach Donovan, he would always say, <laughs> he was a Kentucky Kentucky Wildcat fans. They're just eating. They're eating. They're they're eating roadkill. <laughs> We're, we're going to get a road kill, and, it, you know, they're probably out there eating road kill, or road kill every now and then. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was – Where did it he was, even come up with that? I don't know. Coach Donovan has – you know, Coach, Coach Pelfrey, John Pelfrey, he was the one that had so many uh, isms. He had so many lines and, and similes and all the time. But Coach Donovan was great. Um, UConn, hats off to them. They just – they got really hot. They were out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. They literally were like – just won like nine games in a row after being like a you know six seed <laughs> crazy right. they were mid yeah so was, was that your best memory with billy donovan just like uh, that's those celebrations accomplishing um those feats but also just just learning from him like what what what's something you take from all that time that whole that whole year that our senior year it encompassed so many things from Casey Prather finally figuring out his role, figuring out what he was good at. He put so much work in that summer, being able to see him mature and accept it. And it was funny. I had him on my podcast and my mindset, I always thought it was because he lacked confidence, but it was because he was overconfident, striving to prove, he was striving to prove to Coach Donovan that, no, I can do this. I, this is what I can do. And I'm going to prove you wrong. Instead of, instead of being, having that humility of like, this is what you want me to do, coach? Okay, I'm going to do it really well. I'm going to just, you want me to be a defender and a slasher or whatever? And, and, you know, Casey was trying to fit a circle into a square peg. And then Scotty Wilbekin, after being a great defender, finally stepping up being the offensive role he was. Will you get having microfracture surgery, thinking that he was going to redshirt his last year? He, he thought he was going to redshirt going into that senior year. He, he you know, it, it, it would have been a different year if he started completely healthy, but seeing him growing, then when he was finally able to dunk a basketball again, me finally growing up and not 
having such a bad attitude all the time. Just all that and, come, and just, then us just going on a freaking winning streak. Right. Yeah, I can't say there's one memory. It was it was that whole year when I think about my senior year uh, of just being with Coach Donovan and all of our stories aligning to that awesome team. I never realized Will almost didn't play that year because he yeah. he came in clutch for y'all several games. Yeah, I remember he was crying. He he, he was he, it was uh one day before the season. Um, he and I, he and I, he talked, he went to talk, talk to Coach Donovan and just, it, it was a difficult decision for him. Like he, he thought he was going to have to make that call. He talked to me and I, I was like, bro, you know, I love you, whatever you decide to do. You know, we want you out there. I, we understand that you don't feel as though you can contribute, but I, we guarantee it's going to get better. We're going to be with you the whole way. And, you know, he, he started shooting threes. <laughs> my, guy started, my guy started shooting threes as well, contributing on what way he is now. And, if you see see him play now, he plays so well. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's really, it's really. He's over, he's over in Monaco. We actually just got engaged a few months ago, um, so I'm extremely, extremely happy for him and that he he did decide to finish out that year with us. Yeah, that was huge, Pat. I remember this is just a random memory. I we, I like thought it was going to be my last game, and I told you before the game, it's my last game as a gift. Shoot a three. I don't know if you remember this. Oh, I was going to. <laughs> And I, I like you. heard Billy. Yes, you like pulled up, and Billy was like, "Pat," and you like pulled it down and drove inside. Why didn't you shoot no, it? No, that's not what happened. I was. What? It was the game against Kentucky. Yeah. And it was after after the first half. We're up or whatever time it was, and I, and I'm shooting. I'm shooting a lot of them in in the in the, the halftime, and I'm making I'm making a lot of them because I can shoot it. It's just a, it's a matter of confidence. And I told Will, I said, bro. If you see me, I'm going to stand in the corner, hit your boy. He got it, and he looked at me. I was wide open. He looked at me, and he didn't pass it. I was like, I was going to kill him. I was going to kill him on the court. Like, bro, this is my one chance. This is my one chance. I wanted to hear the fans say, Patrick Young for three. <laughs> I had a celebration. I had everything ready. But my boy, he, 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 he didn't want me to, to live that day. Like, I don't, I don't get it. it. Whatever. Not still bitter. Yeah, I'm still better for sure. So we well, have to blame him right for here. you not having that three in your memory. What do you get? It's all his fault. You get what oh, you no, get. You don't it. get a three. Wilfred, 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 you get. Yeah. <laughs> full name. He gets a full name basis. We yeah. we try to give him. A, we we always try to give him a middle name since he doesn't have one. But uh, can you can you think of one that that meshes well with Wilfred? You get. No. Wil- no. Wilfred, Wilfred doesn't pass the ball to Patrick, you get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you don't, you get, what did we always used to say, like, you get what you get when you get. You get yeah. <laughs> and you you don't get a three, apparently. And you don't, you don't get a three to, P, to PY. I, I'm trying to give you uh, an assist, bro. Like, <laughs> you're, going, you're, you're going to get a stat, too. You're going to get a stat. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. We'll, we'll let him know. Maybe if you come back for, like, another, uh, like just come back for a game. They'll let you shoot one at halftime, <laughs> or like a spring game, you know. Yeah, a spring game. If you guys get Will on the show, it'd be awesome. Uh, like to pop in on him, you just <laughs> pop in on him for a second. Just, just you, if you get him on to, to lock in a, a time, I will pop yeah. in on him for sure. Perfect, and just be like, dude, I'm yeah. still upset. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could interrogate him about why he didn't give you that three. Facts, okay. absolutely. I know that this is your day off, so we won't keep you much longer. We're just speaking of Will, and then you said you've talked to Casey, and I think Scotty's still playing somewhere, right? Yep. Australia. Yep. How much did the four of y'all still stay in touch? Because I know, like, y'all live together, right? Y'all left super, super close. Um, yeah. Just with everybody scattered around the globe, I know it can't be easy, but how much do y'all still keep in touch? We got, we still got the group text going. It's, it's been a little more difficult since um, those three all have – a really serious relationship. Scotty being married, Casey having a very serious relationship, Will being engaged. I'm the I'm the odd man out right now. <laughs> when I when ironically I was uh, thought to be the first one that was going to get married, um, and now I'm over here 29, single, living by myself. Like, uh, <laughs> now nah, I'm good. I'm straight. Like, yeah. Um, you know, we have the group text um, titled "We Getting Old." Um, that we with a with a with a picture of Scotty's Jeep, his old white Jeep Grand Cherokee, the uh, Grand J- uh, Cherokee. I think it was like in two thousand two or two thousand one. Um, we don't chat as much as we used to, um, but you know, with those relationships, we 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 
we meshed over a bond that'll never be broken. Mm -hmm. uh, every summer we, we strive to get together. It's harder for Will since he's um, in France and he's French, especially now during COVID times of, for him to get in. I like how he's um, French is a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard. I think it's hard to get a visa right now uh, for a foreigner to enter the country without a reason. Right. Um, but, you know, when he, if he gets married, when he gets married, I think he will be able to apply for a citizenship. I'm not sure how that whole deal works, but we will see. We will see. I love those guys to death. They, you know, as I said, a bond that will never be broken. They've all been on my podcast. So anyone that hears this, you can find all their episodes. They all have great stories. Um, and I'm just thankful to have been a part of their life journey and to do life for the rest of my life with them. Was there ever anything that happened in that house that maybe you couldn't tell the story at the time, but now you can? Um, uh, really open ended. Well, Bill, Coach Donovan did let us live. Will, Will, you get and I lived together off campus our senior year. Um, I mean, we threw a few house parties. Uh, they threw a surprise house party for me, birthday party, and there were there were sixty people in that house. It was so hot. It was so hot. The house was sweating. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Was there anything else crazy that happened in the house? Uh, I had a dog there uh man i wish you would have let me think of, think of it before no uh, you know will and I, we, all, we did everything together we, we, we all did everything together will will definitely he'll, he'll definitely have a story he doesn't forget anything <laughs> he has he has the memory of an elephant <laughs> <laughs> well i definitely have to get him on um but like i said we won't keep you much longer but jackie did you have anything else Oh, I just wanted to know, like your projects that are going on now. I know you talked about the podcast a little bit, right. but you know the the like the escape room, and you know people in Gainesville. You know those, those kind of projects that you're doing right now, so people can see, you know, and know what's going on, and maybe visit them. Well, I'm striving not to be too busy, even though I I am. Um, I don't think of myself as an entrepreneur, but I, I guess by definition, I am. Uh, Bill Gates said that busy busyness is the new stupid. Um, so I'm striving in all the things that I'm doing, I'm striving to have more balance. Like I said, I'm, I'm getting my master's right now, MSM program. I have five classes left. Uh, I hope and pray I'll be able to walk um, by the summer because this was something I just decided to do on my own. Um, I'm serving, I'm striving to get into this prison ministry here in, in Jacksonville uh, through the Church of 1122. I also mentor at another um, organization called Justified Services here. We have mentorships. Uh, programs for high-risk youth here in here in Jacksonville every Sunday, which I have that tonight. Um, I have an escape room that's it's going to come on year three in Gainesville called America's Escape Game. So thankful of, uh, for my partners that have been um, able to help me run that, learn so much through the business in that. Um, I have an escape room here that I have invested in, and I'm helping my partner. I'm probably going to have to go work there today. Um, if you get a if you're in Jacksonville, I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. We have a Jacksonville Jaguars parody room where I play a role. I play a role uh, in this room. I'll be your game master as well. It's a lot of fun. Um, I don't want to give a spoiler, but um, there may or may not be a do ball chant involved in the game. Um, other than that, you know, I'm just, I'm just striving to do all these things and, and live a life full of service, a life full of giving. Um, Kobe Bryant said it best, um, that greatness is living a life that inspires others. And that's what I'm striving to do. I'm striving to not be so me-centered and um, make my life about serving and, and bringing experience, especially with the escape room, getting people to stop, get off their phones, because you have to work together. You can't be on your phone. You have to communicate. You have to talk to each other. You have to work together. That's why I got into that business. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much me. And we'll, we'll include the, uh, I, I also work at TV20, so I'll make sure to link our, our story about the escape room in Gainesville so people can really see our reporters went through it. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll link it in the comments on our YouTube video so that people can uh, take a look and see what they get into if they do stop by. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Definitely coming to do the Jaguars one, too. <laughs> Let me, you, need, you need four people, at least, at least four people in that room. And we can make it happen. We got two of them. Okay. We got two here. I can get four people. <laughs> Sounds good. Exactly. We'll do it. I think I'm losing you. We'll pack. Thank you so much, for real. This was yeah. awesome. If nothing else, just catch up so with you. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I know, right? Way too yeah. long. Is it, is it weird seeing me without a beard? Like, <laughs> I had a, It really I had kind a of is, because I think last time I, I saw a, you. I had a bald 
spot growing right here. So I was like, well, I guess I have to cut it all off now. <laughs> You're getting old. Hmm. Getting old. That's what getting happened. Old. Yeah. 29. Last time I saw you, it was like really thick. I know. And I think next about time, it. next time you go to anyway. next time you go to Italy, make sure you go in a smart car. It's easier to kind of maneuver your way around. So drive into a smart car, yeah. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> if you find one I can fit into, I'd love to, uh, to do that. Because you, <laughs> well, you, you can of, park them anywhere. You can park them like anywhere. I know. My mom. Smart cars. You know the the Fiat, the smaller Fiat, the Cinquecentos, those those yeah. little Fiats. My mom had uh, that, and she's like, uh, she's obviously not as tall as you, but she was like five. She's five nine, five ten, and she was just like. This is the most uncomfortable thing, but she like kind of goes this way and that way, and she was like maneuvering <laughs> across all this stuff. It was, uh, yeah. I would pay money to watch Patrick Young fold himself into one of those cars. Yes. That's like that's like Shaq <laughs> getting into a Kia or what? What car is that, Shaq? <laughs> yeah, Shaq getting into a Kia or whatever. Yeah, they they show you him sitting in the car. They don't show you him getting in or getting yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> it would it would be a process. It'll be fun. <laughs> It'll be funny oh, for gosh. sure. It's a great escape, right? The great it's a, escape. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great escape. Absolutely. Well, I love talking to Patrick Young and all the stuff that he's, you know, one, dealt with, but also the projects that he's involved so if you're interested in learning more about the escape rooms he's involved with, not only in Gainesville, but also in Jacksonville, Go into our comment section here on our YouTube video, and there will be links and how you can head over there and support a fellow Gator. Um, and obviously, if you want to keep up to date with the latest podcast and videos from Double Coverage, then just make sure you subscribe to this channel and click on that bell so that you can be notified when new episodes are posted. And of course, you can also find us through a podcast if you more want to listen in the car, listen at work when your boss doesn't realize that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, then you can find us on Anchor. It has a list. You can listen to us directly on Anchor, or you can go from there and listen to us on Spotify, Google Podcast. We are working on getting on Apple Podcasts. That should be coming very, very soon. This is just the beginning. We really enjoyed having Patrick Young join us for the last two weeks, but we've got a lot more exciting things lined up and uh, you have to stick around. This is just the beginning of Double Coverage with Jackie and Cassidy.